GMGM, we are back. Hello, all the CPG Genesis and Poppers. Welcome to another Genius Call. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we begin. First of all, the accelerator is running strong. We had a lot of folks come in and join from our open edition of light mode, dark mode, and burn mode. So welcome to all of our new members there. We really hope that you're taking advantage of the accelerator, and we hope that you can continue to join us in all the wonderful chats. Second thing, if you have joined recently or you're just checking in now, please visit rewards.cryptopackagegoods.com. Fill out your profile. We promise you, we've got all sorts of treats and goodies in store. We have lots of great things happening in the next few weeks. And if you join up, you will get your tranche of points and all the wonderful things that you can do with those points is to be announced, but we promise it's gonna be worth your time. Lastly, we will be at NFT Paris. Another set of exciting announcements happening soon. We would love for you to join us. We'd love to meet you in person. And again, we have a lot of fun things planned in real life at NFT Paris. And now we will get to our wonderful guest. Today, I'm interviewing Christine Theriot. Uh, I think I said that right. Shit. Anyway, Christine is the Director of Strategic Partners at World of Women and was previously the Director of Strategic Partners at my BFF. Prior to transitioning to Web3, Christine served as the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Intellect Deals, where she built a robust network of TV and entertainment brand partnerships with mega media giants like The Ellen DeGeneres Show, Wendy Williams, The Real, Access Hollywood, Steve Harvey, and many more. In this genius call, Christine is going to share her practical and tangible career insights with things like creating and designing your ideal role, shooting your shot successfully, working in Web 2 versus working in Web 3, building your Web 3 rep, all these wonderful things that we're going to get into, like utilizing your networks, pay negotiation, which we could spend a ton of time on, and also setting professional boundaries. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Christine. Hello. Hey, everyone. Super excited to be here today. Oh, I'm excited to interview you. So fun kind of preamble. Um, I had never met Christine IRL. It was like the before times when everybody was just a JPEG on the internet. And we met through the Genesis chats um, and had a lot of moments uh, that we shared, I believe, through chat, which was like a really new experience for me that kind of hadn't happened since probably like college, um, which was many moons ago for me. And then in at NFT NYC, we met up in real life and it was like, oh, wow, this internet friendship is actually amazing and even better in real life. So we hit it off. We hung out. We did a lot of fun things. We've met up at a couple of other NFT events, and it has been my joy to call you friend at each and every one of them. Um, so welcome and thank you. I would love for you to talk about your pre-Web3, the before times, before times, um, and more recently, like what you were doing at Intelligent Deals. That's a, probably a great place to start in the sense of like going over uh, a little of my Web2 background. So back at Intelligent Deals, um, I effectively represented several hundred brands in an omnichannel capacity. So um, I would represent brands in multiple different categories, uh, everyone from like your tech brands, like Samsung, um, to like home and goods, like your ninjas and kitchen appliances, to beauty and wellness. Uh, and I would place them in opportunities for online sales, um, TV opportunities, subscription boxes, uh, and retail and wholesale. So a little bit of everything. So essentially, if a brand were to come to my previous agency and say like, hey, um, you know, we essentially want to find growth pathways in places that we aren't. And so my company would go out and we'd find all the different uh, platforms and places that uh, there might be a fit for them to be on. And we pitch to all the associated buyers, television producers, and um, selectively place them on the calendar throughout the year so that they'd be able to generate sales, uh, have marketing opportunities, bring in awareness for their brand. Uh, and our agency would just make a commission off of each respective placement. So 
it made it a, a really great flywheel for brands to get in places that they hadn't been before. And it really enabled our agency to have this like incredible reach because we were also uh, representing some of the, the biggest brands in the world. And so it enabled us to get through doors that um, were sometimes typically difficult to get through and be able to negotiate with some of the bigger media giants where that previously was more difficult. So it was um, it was definitely a very um, different world than coming into Web3 for sure. Oh, Mikey, I think you're muted. I think that when we first met, we you were well down the rabbit hole of of Web3 and you were sort of tinkering, I think, with moving full time into Web3. But I want to pause before the jump into Web3, like what attracted you to crypto and NFT specifically? And what was your first kind of experience with Web3? With crypto, I think it was easier. Um, back in, I think, 2015, I had purchased, uh, I think, Bitcoin and Ethereum for the first time. And there was this, this sort of obvious to me when it came to supporting something that meant decentralization or pulling away some of the power from banks and also being able to transfer money very quickly. Like, to me, like... Crypto was the easiest thing to wrap my mind around, um, but it took it took a lot longer for NFTs. And it started with that whole movement of when everyone was longing for a connection and everyone was on Clubhouse and talking about uh, a variety of topics. And one of them that just happened to be seemingly uh, a, a very much all day, every day topic for Farouk especially back then was NFTs and Bored Apes and Friends With You and a couple of other um, really big projects that had their limelight back in the day in that format. And for me, it still was like something that was a little bit foreign and it wasn't something that I latched onto. But ultimately, after a couple of people that I knew in e-commerce had started moving towards doing something in blockchain for their career, and also just NFTs became more prevalent in the media and it became more newsworthy. Uh, and it sort of just like piqued my interest. And I had done a bit of research and I ended up finding World of Women, which is, um, which is fairly ironic uh, knowing where I am now, but it really was that first moment for me that kind of clicked. Um, and it wasn't because of, you know, ex just the art. It wasn't because of just one thing. It was the, uh, the full total package. And I went into the Discord. I saw that there was like a budding community underneath. Um, I saw that they were taking this very seriously as a business. Um, they were arguably like the most iconic um, women-led project that started like right from the get-go. Uh, and so it, it was very attractive for me also in just this... Um, discussions surrounding IP and what people can do with intellectual property, how they're able to uh, capitalize on this new movement of brands being on the blockchain. And so uh, I really felt super strongly about it at the time to the point where um, I had thrown down, I want to say it was like around three and a half ETH or like close to around $11,000 at the time um, on my first, first World of Women. And that was um, definitely my biggest investment into the world of NFTs. And I remember being so passionate about it and talking to everyone that I knew that I had made this purchase. And kind of like I was, I was a little bit nuts because it's like all I would talk about for several weeks on end. But um, it, it ended up bleeding like so much into what I was doing in my agency that I remember talking to one of my clients on a call at one point. And I was like, yeah, and by the way, like I recently invested in this company called World of Women. And uh, one of my clients was like, so inspired by the fact that I was doing this, that he went and he bought one the next day. Um, and I remember that was sort of like my signaling, like, one, there's some real notable promise here in what this can do. Two, um, I clearly made an investment that was enough to where I could unintentionally sell it to another person. Um, so that's already a good sign. And then three, uh, it definitely was just like a big signal to me personally that I had really put a lot of myself into um, wanting to learn more about the industry and also like 
putting my money where my mouth was and there just became this inevitable magnetism towards just wanting to do more in web three. And I think that's where it really started for me. So you made this transition now and I want to talk about, well, not now you've made it, but at that moment you were really, from what I recall, it was a big decision to move full time into web three. And I think as we've gotten to know each other, and I can say this with confidence, you're extremely thoughtful in how you approach most things in life. And for sure, when it comes to then like, oh, I'm going to provide for myself through my job, through my career, that leap into something that was very much on the bleeding edge of where tech is, I think you can now argue like crypto and AI are kind of like on those frontiers for folks. How did you parse out and what was your transition like? What, what were you considering? For, I, think, I think for folks that are here listening, a big part of what you've achieved, especially for our folks that are building in Web3 and the Accelerator, like the macro industry has changed a ton around crypto specifically. And I think the environment around the bear market that is now in full swing of like the people who are here are like the faithful. They are the maxis of crypto and Web3. So what factors did you consider and like what were you weighing in your mind um, and out, out loud about taking that leap into Web3? And how was it like kind of different than, you know, a Web2 job decision? I guess I should start by saying that whenever I discovered World of Women was not necessarily when I started working for them. Um, I should definitely reformat that part of the story to clarify a bit more because I think another reason why people are so attracted to my story is because it's anything but linear. Uh, you know, I, I came into the industry with like a peaked curiosity um, and this, this magnetism that I spoke about earlier, but it wasn't until I started making little steps and then eventually a giant leap uh, before things started to really um, fully align for where I am currently. So um, those months that were sort of after my big world of women purchase, I had discovered boss beauties and it was like before they even minted out before they had even like really become a presence in the space at all. In fact, like no one knew who they were. <laughs> uh, and back then I had just kind of like struck up conversation with the founders and um, I decided to moderate for them, which is so funny to me, like looking back on it now, because like I was running a multi-million dollar business, like I was scaling up my agency and we were incredibly successful, but you know, after a certain hour, like I would go onto discord and like talk to the community of off beauties and it, like would bring me so much joy. Uh, and, and back then too, when it was so early, it just gave me this great opportunity to get to know what communities were like on the ground level of like when things started, um, what things look like for, um, you know, building a successful community. Um, you know, Lisa and Anthony take a lot of careful approach in how they build. And so being a part of that, you know, even as just like this, you know, one-off moderator who was just like, doing it for fun um, was really an enriching experience and it drew me that much closer to wanting to do more. And at that stage, like I had kind of become hooked on communities or at least finding the right ones that were for myself. And at this stage, like the, the industry was like getting more and more saturated. There were like, obviously like more and more NFT projects that were coming out, but there was one that we all know <laughs> uh, that came onto the scene uh, and result of actually some uh, a lot of clubhouse success and that was CPG and I remember very distinctly Chris Cantino and his like very ominous uh, Twitter posts about like how you should turn on notifications and so I had done that um, and in the middle of making a stir fry um, I had gotten a notification on my phone and sure enough it was like we're minting now like it wasn't even like we're minting in a little while it's like we're minting now um, and so I screamed across my uh, my condo for my partner to like grab the stir fry and I ran across to my office to go get my ledger. Um, and I was one of the first people that minted a Genesis token. And that literally changed my life. Um, and I say that like without any hesitation and without any hyperbole because it, it really did. 
um, after joining CPG, it not only allowed me this place to be able to communicate with the incredible, obviously, mentors that, you know, Chris and Jamie had brought in initially, but it created this place for me to be able to socialize in a completely new way um, with people that were either successful already in Web3 or trying to find their success in some way. Um, and so for me, as someone who was like purely dabbling, mind you, like I was like moderating for fun. I had invested like more money than I ever thought I would. Like I had not even fully thought about it as like a full-time career. I thought, you know, maybe very nonchalantly like, huh, that would be really cool one day if eventually I found myself doing that. But uh, it ended up accelerating quite a lot because whenever you find yourself typically in a group of um, really amazingly generally uh, influential people, especially, uh, you tend to find that opportunities gravitate towards you one way or another if you put yourself out there. Um, and so in that period of time when CPG was in its infancy, there was this discussion about creating subgroups um, where people would be able to sort of find um, like a particular topic or hobby or interest. Um, and so many subgroups were born, like the athletic club was born, um, you know, a lot of a lot of like very random ones. And so for me, um, myself and Alex Marshall had created NBA, also known as No Boys Allowed, uh, which now is also a pop group. But back then, this was like our our area and chat where we could sort of bring all the women together and just like talk on the day to day. And it was a day to day for us. Like it was, um, I think even more active in some instances than the, the normal chat because um, all the women really valued just being in that place together. It was like myself, Jamie, Ariel Wingroff, like some really badass uh, women who were there just like talking about our experiences um, what our thoughts were on on certain trends and developments in the industry. And at that stage, um, Jamie had expressed that she might be doing something. It was kind of like, oh, like I might have found my co-founder. I might do something and that's separate from CPG, um, you know, kind of just in these like ideating phases. And as things had progressed, uh, my that the magnetism had grown stronger for me. Like so like at this stage, like there were two, tracks that were running. Jamie was developing her idea and having it become um, like coming more into fruition. And at that stage, I imagine like she had found Brit. And so for me, on the other end, like I, you know, was still very much having a successful business on the agency side, but I had like, <laughs> I had made a Twitter, <laughs> like I had, um, you know, found myself digging in and getting in more rabbit holes. I had joined more communities. I had um, started, you know, finding myself checking news more often. So like I had become a lot more ingrained in the culture too. And that was a big thing um, as far as like making me more inclined to make this more of a career change. Um, but it wasn't until Jamie had come a little bit further along and I had reached out. <laughs> it was very almost awkward because I had reached out via telegram to ask for her email so that I could email her to schedule a call so that we eventually jumped on a call together <laughs> and discussed about how I was interested in joining whatever she was cooking up and so that was like the very initial phases of where um, that initiative started to become something that actually was manifesting into something very real yeah your employee won at BFF like that's pretty dope um, I think there's so much for us to like recount from what you just covered for the folks that are really seeking kind of how to dive into web three. What do you think the key takeaway from that first phase of your experience is? It sounded to me like you were aggressive in pursuing aggressive sounds wrong. Like you were just persistent in pursuing something that interested you and you put forward what your skill set was. But what would you say? What would advice would you give to folks on that? Just going out and exploring and discovering and finding what makes you tick and what makes you feel excited 
about the space and like really latching onto that. Um, I think that that's a, a really big factor to consider that and who are you looking to potentially align with? Like for me personally, I, I left um, a 10, almost 10 year long career uh, in working at a very successful group of companies um, and doing what I loved in web two, but it wasn't until I had absolute conviction on the type of people and the type of entrepreneurs that I wanted to align with in Web3 that I started to really think seriously about you know, what those moves would be um, and, and taking it into, I guess, the next phase of my life. But I would say exploration um, and also just making sure that you are really thinking on what the future looks like for your career and um, not coming at it from like a static approach, but like, what could it evolve into? Um, I remember when I took initiative with Jamie, like it was a, a great opportunity for me being the first employee, but um, you also have to understand like what you're walking into. Um, it, it definitely is uh, an industry that is ripe with startups. And so, you know, taking initiative and um, making sure that you're able to cover all your bases is super important whenever you're making those first steps. Absolutely. One quick reminder for our listeners that are listening to this. We have a PO app. The PO app code is going to be in the chats. Please make sure that you are redeeming it. Uh, again, our rewards.cryptopackagegoods.com accumulates all of your interactions with Club CPG. And we promise there are lots of fun things that come as a result of leveling up and participating in season two. All right, so let's get down to some really brass tacks of execution in the partnership realm. So you are the director of partnerships. You have a pretty same but different role in terms of the industries. Um, what are some of the differences that you found between dealing with and working with Web2 versus Web3 companies? I mean, I think the relationship dynamic is a lot more straightforward in Web 2. Um, and in Web 3, there's still a lot of figuring out to do, just like as an, an industry. And, and what I mean by that, for instance, is like even vetting opportunities is fairly different for a variety of reasons. And like many of these companies and chains, and they're all fairly new in comparison to platforms and institutions that have been around for several decades. Um, it's so much simpler to get deals done or research encompassed for businesses that have proven track records of success, like in Web 2, for example. And that's not to say that they don't exist in Web 3. They're just significantly more different to identify and weed through as you evaluate and what makes the most sense for the brand in question. So, like, for me, whenever I'm thinking on what to pursue with a uh, a web two brand in my former agency career, you know, it, it's a lot more straightforward because, you know, a lot of the companies I can dig up, you know, robust histories of business and success with, I can look up, you know, their uh, financial holdings and data, customer records, testimonials, uh, you know, some of these platforms that we've been, we've been using both like on the marketplace side and also like, um, L2s or other technologies in Web3, they're just so new. And, and so they don't have um, a lot of this kind of backing where I could go in confidently and approach um, a relationship similar to Web2. You have to do a lot more digging. You have to go to a lot more trouble to uh, identify those types of customer testimonials whenever you're evaluating, uh, especially different types of services for your business. So I, I would say that it just, uh, it's a very different landscape in comparison and you're having to um, to think a lot more creatively on, on the approach, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit more later on how that's accomplished through BD, which is its own uh, animal in itself. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. That is a very large chasm. There's just not a body of work um, reputationally for folks. And I think we find it in that in a lot of places where people are doxxed, it becomes a bit easier 
but it's still not a guarantee that the project that you're going to att attach yourself to is destined to be a success. Um, and that's a gen generally a disclaimer for like things in life, right? Um, prior performance does not <laughs> guarantee similar outcomes. Um, so you just started it. Wow. And this was different. You are now coming from web three to web three. What was the difference for joining WoW as opposed to, you know, joining BFF? I think the most noticeable difference is definitely in team size uh, and, and just like the availability of, of resources. Um, BFF is definitely a smaller in, in, but like very resourceful team in itself. But um, since WoW has like a bit more time under its belt and I think, uh, you know, with like the whole separate aspect of the business purely being on philanthropy. So not people are aware. Um, WoW is actually two entities, both the, the studio side, which is the, um, the revenue pursuit, uh, actual business element to it. And then there is the nonprofit philanthropy side, which is like a, a bit more focused on the education and the charity elements. And so um, naturally, it has a bit more individuals to be able to run both sides of the equation. And so, um, you know, coming to a team of 23, it definitely, um, it provides its own set of benefits and challenges, because you're obviously navigating, um, dealing with a lot more people and departments as opposed to things being um, a lot more streamlined because you have like a much smaller team. Uh, so I think for me, like it, it really came down to like the operational differences, ironically, being the ones that were uh, the most noticeable right off, uh, right, right out the gate. But um, it, the companies themselves, like they share a lot of mission alignment and uh, a lot of values that are similar. And so like that for me, was one of the more positive elements of, of changing between the two is because like the, the mission is still very much similar in nature, but um, like the dynamic of how the team is and like how we operate is, is definitely different than at BFF for sure. Wonderful. So now let's get down to some brass tacks in the literal negotiation of which I've been privy to share seeing some of your templates for how I've leveraged some of your templates for working with partnerships, but we're going to talk about more of the personal side of things. Early in my career, I had the great benefit of sitting down at lunch with like the chief innovation officer at a company that I won't disclose. And I had already been hired, but he gave me his kind of like philosophy on getting hired and negotiating pay. Um, and he was always of the opinion, like, I will listen to every offer. It's like, but I will not take jobs that do not reflect my worth. Um, would you share with us your approach and your strategy for negotiating pay and benefits? And what are the of those strategies have worked the best for you in the past? I think for me, I... I really come from a place where I am coming from like a very unconventional background where, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have also a, a very normal educational conclusion when it came to college. Like I went to college several times, but I ultimately didn't get my degree. Um, I had a very, uh, I had a variety of professions in my life before I ended up where I am today. But, Ultimately, when I did get to a certain career point in my life where um, I was making six figures, I had accumulated quite a bit of experience, it, it came down to really focusing on all of the progression I had made and putting that in front of the people that made those decisions. And while it might sound simple, I think it's important to extrapolate as much as possible from your experience to really make the most of whatever you, you're negotiating or whatever you're um, trying to accomplish with getting a certain amount of money. And that for me was like really multifaceted because um, 
you know, I had really taught myself so much uh, and, and also built a network um, almost entirely from scratch. And so taking these elements apart and dissecting them and being able to not only articulate that, but being able to write it out uh, was immensely helpful. So, you know, narrowing down like what your um, accomplishments are is probably one of the tips that I would put forward in making sure that you are as uh, detailed as possible. Um, every accomplishment that you can think of that um, has any kind of notoriety both to yourself or to the company that you worked for, um, whether that's, you know, you helped X amount of profitability, you closed um, X amount of accounts, you made um, X amount of money, uh, you worked with this list of businesses. Uh, I think really making sure that your accomplishments are front row and center whenever you're talking about money um, is essential to the equation because if you're forgetting whole pieces of the puzzle that are arguably some of your biggest strengths or um, some of your more noteworthy accomplishments, you are not advocating fully for yourself in a lot of ways and you're not putting everything on the table um, to be able to understand your worth as not only an employee, but as an individual, um, as someone that can um, be able to achieve certain milestones. I think um, whenever you're you're laying things out to a potential employee, a potential employer, um, it's it's going to be a di different than if it were an existing employer. But the the premise is still the same. You need to be able to really make sure that. Um, as much as possible that you feel is going to be noteworthy in these discussions is put as a highlight because it's easy for us to go through the day to day um, and and have these accomplishments but not really write them down, centralize them in one place, um, and and really like iron out like what is uh, allowing the company that you're working for, the type of success that you're directly putting into it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting. The listing of accomplishments, I think a lot of folks really would kind of bristle at, but when you sit down to do it, it is supremely important. Um, it's important, I think, for two big reasons that I've had experience with in the past. One is you have a very tangible list of your accomplishments. But the other part is that when you're going into a meeting to negotiate, the confidence is something that needs to be there. And that list serves as a very important reminder of like, yeah, I did all this. It's I, I did this. Um, when people are trying to get that best leveraged payout and shifting from web two to web three, what's the best advice you've received in that regard? I think for me, it was, it was never really easy because um, all you can do is, is look at comparatives. Um, whether it's, a previous position in business development, in my case, to um, allude to a, a position in Web3 that is partnerships focused, you can only really lean on your strengths and accomplishments and be able to provide figures that um, are as realistic as possible. Um, I think that knowing average market rate is is one of those things that is helpful but not necessarily always going to be um, exactly as portrayed online because you're entering a completely different sector that is evolving and once again is is wrought with mostly startups so you're not working with the same type of capital or you're not in a corporate environment so i think going in and also understanding that um you know, you're, I hate to say this, but you're likely not going to, to get the same uh, type of deal or offerings as you would directly from uh, a Web2 position is likely. It's not a guarantee. You're not, you're not going to make for sure less money if you go into Web3, 
but it's definitely something that I think people who are interested in having it be a full-time position for them, that that is a likely factor to consider. You you will probably make less, <laughs> at least from the beginning. But that's not to say that you can't make more, that there aren't growth opportunities, but um, it's definitely uh, something that you need to mentally prepare yourself as you're walking into um, to the industry and that it likely won't be um, exactly what you're looking for on paper, but always good to strive towards as, as much as you can accomplish in that arena. Thank you. One of the exercises that I think we all constantly go through, I know I personally do, and I've read lots of folks taking pauses from social media or pauses from just the news this idea of setting these professional boundaries and personal boundaries with your work environment. Web three is 24 by seven. Um, our chats literally circumnavigate the globe. And if I left notifications on continually, it would just light up. And you and I have shared a lot. And I know you've had some back and forth with managing those boundaries. Can you share some of both your stories and experiences with setting those boundaries and what are some successful tactics that you've embraced in this new Web3 world? Within the last month and a half, I've done a really good job at creating time blocks in my calendar to just like walk away from my computer, which has been great. Um, I am a big advocate for standing desks, um, I have, I used to have a, like a really, really bad tendency. And even sometimes now I do, and I have to like wean myself away from doing it, um, is, is sometimes like you have a tendency to just like sit on the couch or sit on the bed and work. And, um, I think for me working remotely, especially for the past like four plus years now, it's, it's been, um, it's been a consistent challenge in just ensuring that not only are you keeping your professional and your personal life balanced, but you're also ensuring that your environments are reflective of that. Um, because it's really easy to get into this work mode at home when you're not really setting environment boundaries. So like I, I really try hard to, to only work in my office. Um, I try really hard to take that time off of in my calendar and like get out of my office and walk around. Um, I have been like really trying hard to um, make my own food at home as opposed to just like constantly, you know, getting things delivered in. And while all of these might not sound like your typical ways to set boundaries like that, it, it definitely does make a really big difference in how you're able to uh, approach working and being able to carve out like sacred spaces within your home environments that are related to your career and separate them from your personal time. Um, so with that, like when I enter my living room or my bedroom, I'm not, you know, thinking that I can just like sit down and work all of a sudden. Um, whenever I'm taking that time, you know, on my calendar, I'm reserving that time for myself. Um, so that I can step away. So I think just like being mindful of the where you are, where your time is being spent, and trying your best to formulate boundaries between the two of them is is all we can do, especially if you're remote. <laughs> uh, you want to talk 24-7. Being Web3 is 24-7 and being remote feels like it's 24-7. So it's like only up to us to be able to try and, you know, carve out that time and um, an environment to where it fully benefits our day to day. The breaks are key. And I think long and short breaks. One of the things that I've found um, with the CPG community is that it takes a, a complete village to have this community run uh, everything from mods to the, the social folks to the folks that are really attentive to the technical end of coding our rewards program. Uh, we have an amazing design team. There are roles across the spectrum um, that are not just founders or coders or community managers. And what advice do you 
give to folks as they're kind of approaching Web3 to find the role that suits them um, in this space? I think identifying your strengths is super important here. Um, understanding what you can bring to the table uh, is more important than any a typical role that you could define for yourself or that a company could define for you. Um, I remember when I was at BFF, even originally, like I was hiring people that I didn't even have a role for. I just identified strengths and skill sets that I knew would be extremely valuable. And I took that internally to try and figure out what made the most sense. Um, and even in a, a conversation I was having months ago with, um, as I was like sort of going into what my my role would be, this is when I was um, contemplating going to World of Women or, or another particular organization. And when I was speaking to them, um, it was enlightening in the conversation because uh, at that particular dinner, they were like, well, like we know your strengths, like we don't really, we don't care what your title would be. Like we'll figure that part out later. And that always struck me as like very interesting because that sort of also speaks to Web3 as a whole. It's like, all right, well, like, you know, we're all just figuring this shit out. And as long as you're good at what you do, and as long as you have what we need for you to get it done, like all the rest of it is just trivial bullshit anyway. Um, and I love that. I just, I love the fact that um, if you have a particular array of skill sets to be able to um, help bring success to an organization and there's nothing that's clearly defined, I think more than anything in this industry, it's worth the conversation. Um, and, you know, I think that also applies, especially to the creatives. Um, there's never going to be like an exact moment in time where you, you know, have a, a very particular art style or a very particular skill set um, and, and you um, can go out and find that particular skill set for a particular company. Sometimes like you just have it and it's about you taking initiative and going to let people know that those are skill sets you have and then them allowing that opportunity to evaluate where opportunities might be available to you. So I think like half the battle is just like letting people know what you're good at. And then the other half is them figuring out how to put you somewhere where you can actually make an impact. I love it. I love the entrepreneurial space. Um, I think anybody that's in, in this cutting edge, as you've sort of alluded to, another way of saying it is like, there are no titles, there are just jobs to be done. And the camaraderie that gets developed by digging in on just the jobs to be done by being scrappy really forges bonds that you don't necessarily get in a larger corporate sense. Um, and it is a special time. I would also say that both in startups and particularly Web3, because most of them feel like startups or are startups, the idea of having tiny fractions of your time being leveraged in this kind of gig economy, like everybody needs help. Everyone has skills to offer. And it's really a matter of taking the time and energy to match them that then accelerates sort of your growth in that department, but also the relationship you have with those communities. Um, I think it's wonderful what you've been able to traverse these past few years. I certainly enjoy working with you both professionally and, and chilling personally. And I think that the folks that are out there who are listening to this are going to take away a lot of, um, I think you have said this to me in person more than anybody else I know. And I, I hang with a lot of basketball players, but it's like, shoot your shot. And you embody shooting your shot. You know exactly, and sometimes you don't even know exactly what you want to do, but you go for it. And the success and the benefits that other people around you have benefited from that is clear. So we're going to roll it and wrap it here. Um, quick reminder to redeem that PO app. Quick reminder to also fill out your profile on rewards.cpg or rewards.cryptopackagegoods.com. And Christine, I'll give you the final word. 
I'm just super stoked to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Mikey. And I hope that um, anything that I had to say will help someone be able to make their first steps into their career journey in Web3. I know for me, it, like I mentioned earlier, it definitely wasn't linear, but it rarely is. Um, so when in doubt, as Mikey mentioned, shoot your shot. Um, as Wayne Gretzky would say, you miss 100% of the shots that you never take. Uh, that's my life philosophy, and I truly believe that. So um, just looking forward to hearing those accounts of people shooting their shots. And uh, I'm always available, and my messages are always open if people ever have any questions about shooting theirs. Thank you.